All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's event. I just want to do a quick sound check. Are you is everyone able to hear me? Okay. Someone can confirm. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Well, my name is Haritha, and I'm one of the Calgary Public Library Board members. And I'm pleased to kick off this evening's event by starting off by giving a bit of a brief background. Cancer treatments are evolving at an incredible pace. Care teams have increasingly more tools available to treat patients with cancer, and these tools are being tested and translated to the clinic through clinical trials. So some of the questions we will be covering in today's seminar include, how do cancer clinical trials work? What is Calgary doing to advance the development of new medicine through these clinical trials? What exactly is big data and how can it help guide cancer treatment decisions? What opportunities for better treatments will emerge through the creation of the new Calgary Cancer Center? So please join the experts from the Tom Baker Cancer Center and the University of Calgary's Department of Oncology as they shared the latest on cancer clinical trials and the new Calgary Cancer Center. I would now like to pass it off to the moderator, Jennifer Chan, to take us through this evening's event. Jennifer? Okay, I'm just starting to share. Oops, screen sharing has failed. <laughs> Great, let's try that again. Um, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen now? Hopefully you can. Yep. All right, perfect. Okay, so um, hi everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer Chan. I am a pathologist, I'm a cancer researcher, and I'm the deputy director of the Sharpe Cancer Institute at the University of Calgary. And I'll be your moderator for this evening. First of all, we're really glad to, that you could make it. Um, and this is uh, this has now become our series. It's our fourth session of our public lecture series, Late Night Lab. Um, and it's a place where we um, talk about different aspects of cancer, share some of our research work, um, and um, open it up for questions, uh, anything you'd like to know um, about the topic uh, for the evening. Uh, in tonight's session, we're delving into how potential cancer drugs are tested in patients through clinical trials, um, and also what we can learn um, after drugs are approved and then used in the real world. Um, tonight, I'm gonna just, oops advance my slides here. Tonight, uh, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a little bit of background information on this area, and then I'll introduce you to our um, three, or I'll let the three guest speakers speak for themselves, <laughs> but our guest speakers are Dr. Danny Hang, Dr. Winston Chung, and Dr. Don Morris. Uh, De uh, Dr. Hang is a professor at the University of Calgary and a medical oncologist um, at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. He specializes in uh, genital urinary cancers, um, particular cancers of the kidney. He leads the International um, Metastatic Renal Cell uh, Carcinoma Database Consortium and is active in a lot of clinical trials and in the development of criteria for guiding treatment uh, in kidney cancer patients. Um, Dr. Winston Chung will be our second um, speaker. He's um, also a medical oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center, specializing in uh, GI cancers. Uh, he's the Director of Real World Evidence at Cancer Care Alberta and is also the lead um, of the Provincial Oncology Outcomes Program. And then finally, uh, Dr. Don Morris, we get a, a treat, a uh, sneak peek at our new Calgary Cancer Center. Don is the head of the Department of Oncology at the University of Calgary and also the medical director at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. He's the um, AHS medical lead for the Calgary Cancer Project, which is the design of the um, new cancer hospital. And he's gonna give us an overview on the progress of the building of the new uh, cancer center and what it really represents for um, cancer care and research in Calgary in the future. Um, so if you have questions during the talk, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have all these presentations um, and then we're gonna hold all the questions to the end. Um, so if you have questions during the talk, you, talks, you can type them into the chat box. So don't use the little raise hand thing, use the chat box. Type them into the chat box. Um, we're going to collate the questions and I'll moderate the questions at the end. Um, just as one uh, point of clarification, uh, even though we have many, many uh, well accomplished um, medical oncologists here on the call, um, just uh, to note that this forum isn't the 
forum for dispensing medical advice. And for that, really, you should um, connect with your uh, treating oncologist. But we welcome any questions about the research that's presented or things that are going on here. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to lead you through just a few introductory slides. If I can actually advance my slides. There we go. So just as a, as a review, um, you know, we cover all sorts of things in, in this late night lab, the public lecture series. Um, we've talked about the molecular basis of cancer, um, you know, why it occurs, what risk factors. We've talked about cancer in the population and some prevention. Um, tonight, we're really going to focus on um, the information that we need to get in order to bring new drugs and new treatments to the clinic. Um, so how do we how do we find new things? How do we test new things? How do we um, figure out if they're going to work, or, or you know, are we are we supposed to be treating our patients this way or the other way? So that really comes through clinical trials. Um, so clinical trials are really um, this path to new new therapies. Uh, so new therapies they start with discovery science. Um, so science in the labs. It could be um, looking at patient tissues. It could be um, looking at animal models of cancer. Um, so that, that's quite basic science, but then there's a step of innovation, just broadly innovation. Oh, could we use this new target? Um, could we manipulate it? Could we block it um, in order to have some kind of potential therapy? And then finally, um, take that innovation and bring it to the real world. So this um, stuff on the left over here, this is what we call sort of preclinical um, testing or preclinical research. And the process of bringing um, a potential new therapy to the clinic would be through the process of clinical trials. And that's what we're focusing on tonight. So cancer clinical trials, um, you know, it's a kind of three very short words, but it really means lots of things. Um, and uh, through clinical trials, um, a series of clinical trials, uh, we, we want to answer many different questions. We want to answer, um, is this potential new drug safe? Um, what dose should we use? Um, does it work? And that's very important. Um, and for whom does it work? Um, so what setting should we use it in? Um, and how does it compare to other uh, therapies that are out there right now? Um, and so all of these are um, designed to be answered through a series of clinical trials. Um, clinical trials usually start out, you'll, you'll hear more about this. I'll just give you the overview. Clinical trials usually start out with a kind of a small select group of patients um, where you're testing a a therapy and you know, kind of look for uh, evidence of a response. Um, this type of um, study uh, comparing, okay, first of all, does it work? And then also how does it compare to its um, standard therapy is one part of the evidence needed to um, figure out if a, a drug is gonna be useful in the clinic. Um, and this type of research is often conducted in larger medical centers, academic medical centers, where there's a lot of research activity. Um, that type of evidence is the type of evidence that would lead to something like um, a Health Canada or FDA drug approval. But once it's approved, um, there's still work to be done. Uh, we need to know how does this work in the real world, right? Uh, cancer clinical trials um, in earlier stages are very controlled with small population, um, but that not, may not be reflective of um, the general population. So we really need to look at real world outcomes and that's uh, part of what we'll hear tonight. And that, uh, again, usually is out there in different settings, different hospitals. Um, the patients might be of all sorts in different um, conditions. Uh, overall, this entire um, timeline might uh, take you know, 15 years from the initial discovery to review and approval. Um, I just wanted to say one thing, uh, that, that 15 years, that's if you're starting kind of from scratch, if you're starting from basic research and everything goes smoothly, uh, and then you, know, you have something effective, um, 15 years later, you might be having an approved drug. Um, there is a, um, a more recent approach uh, that's been taken by uh, a few people called drug repurposing. And that's when um, you can use, um, let's say a compound that was previous develop, previously developed and shown to be safe um, in humans, but we don't know if it's good for this particular disease. So you can kind of skip all this, you know, testing in cells, testing in animals. You already know it's, uh, you know, safe to be administered, but you just want to figure out if it works. So you can cut down a lot of that, of that timeline of drug development um, by looking for drugs that have already been proven to be safe in humans. So anyway, that's my um, broad overview of um, uh, cancer clinical trials and what we're going to be talking about tonight. 
So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to let um, uh, Dr. Hang take it over for me. And maybe I will stop share. And then you can, can you share your screen now? Yep, perfect. Perfect. So I'm just going to sh uh, put this in presentation mode. And I want to thank everyone for being online. Um, uh, it's a Tuesday evening, um, and uh, you're here with us in the late night uh, lecture series. And I think it's so cool that, uh, uh, that uh, you want to learn more and um, uh, be a part of this journey for cancer discovery. So um, I'm Danny Hang. Um, I'm a medical oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center here at the University of Calgary. And uh, I want to talk in particular about clinical trials and how the clinical research unit, the CRU, um, helps uh, make clinical trials happen at the Tom Baker Cancer Center, sort of the nuts and bolts. And really, um, uh, clinical trials are one of the engines for cancer discovery. And so I want to talk about that. So how do we get new and better treatments for cancer? Because we always want to improve uh, our, our mode of operation really is to keep trying to get better and better and better at what we do until we can cure cancer. And until we can cure cancer, we need to keep doing clinical trials. So we always have uh, clinical trials um, uh, that test new drugs, new combinations, uh, or repurposed drugs, as Dr. Chan was mentioning. And uh, let me show you how we get there. So from a test tube, if something looks really interesting to a Petri dish, if something looks really interesting, how do we bring this into the clinic? How do we bring this into patient uh, care? So we first uh, start off with phase one clinical trials. So phase one clinical trials um, are uh, trials that are smaller. Generally, they have about 30, maybe 40 people. Um, and they're really looking for what is the right dose of drug in the human body. And so uh, we just created this drug because it looked promising in other in most models and, uh, and in other animals potentially. And, um, and so we want to see, okay, can we use this in humans? Is it safe to use in humans? What are some of the side effects that happen? And what's the maximum dose that we can get to? Or what's a good dose that we can stay at? And that's what the phase one clinical trial does. Then there are phase two clinical trials. So in a phase one clinical trial, now we know what the dose is. A phase two clinical trial is, okay, well, how effective is this therapy in, the, in, in, um, in humans? And so uh, it may choose a particular type of cancer to study. So for example, maybe breast cancer. And uh, you give um, uh, several people with breast cancer this drug and you see what is the response rate? Uh, uh, what's the survival like? Do, does it look Look very promising or not. And these trials are usually bigger. They're usually about, you know, a, you know they may be 50, 80 people um, uh, in the clinical trial. And uh, we're, the whole idea is just to see, okay, is there some sort of signal of efficacy? And uh, is it good enough to take on a phase three clinical trial? So here's a phase three clinical trial where we're looking at, okay, we've got this new drug or this new therapy. So it doesn't have to be a drug. It could be new radiation therapy. It could be new, uh, a new sequence of doing things. Maybe we do chemotherapy first and then surgery versus surgery, then chemotherapy. So a phase three clinical trial takes that experimental way of doing things and compares it to our existing standard of care. It compares it to uh, what we normally would do now because in order for us to approve a drug, we have to show that this new drug or this new way of doing things beats uh, what we currently do in terms of do our patients live longer, our cure rates better, um, uh, our, our response rates better, uh, do the, does the tumor shrink more uh, using this regimen. And so that's how we decide uh, whether or not uh, we can go towards approval or not. Then, if that's positive, then we can think about Health Canada FDA approval, and we can only use drugs that are Health Canada and FDA approved. The reason why we're so careful in doing this, and the reason why we can't just try things from the test tube or try things that work in monkeys or rats, is because the human body is very, very different. 
And we have many, many examples where it looks very promising in a test tube or it looks very promising in another type of disease or another type of cancer, but in the context of a phase three clinical trial, it doesn't work at all. And so we don't want to expose our patients to ineffective therapies uh, in terms of side effects, in terms of cost. Uh, we want to give our patients what's best and what's available uh, th that is the best uh, to treat our patients with. And then after that, there are phase four clinical trials and real world evidence. So once something is already approved, once we're already um, using it, then we get a chance to see out in the population, what does it look like? Does it really truly work? Uh, what are the response rates like? And Dr. Winston Chung, who's speaking right after me, will address this a lot uh, in terms of real world evidence and the importance of real world evidence, studying things in populations uh, that aren't normally uh, studied in clinical trials. So for example, patients with brain metastases or patients that live 400 kilometers away from their nearest clinical trial center, uh, those patients might not be eligible for clinical trials, so might not be included in clinical trials. So we need to study those patients as well. It takes a lot of work to do clinical trials. So this is our CRU. I used to be the medical lead of uh, the CRU, and now it's Dr. Jose Monzon, um, uh, and uh, his uh, co-lead is uh, Rose Farrell. And uh, it takes a lot of people to run this ship for clinical trials. So right now, there are 146 actively accruing clinical trials at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. And it takes 76 staff, including coordinators, finance people, nurses, contracts, um, uh, pharmacists, compliance officers to run those clinical trials. So it is a really big uh, show. There are thousands of patients at the Tom Baker Cancer Center currently undergoing follow-up in clinical trials. And what's interesting about clinical trials is that clinical trials provide patients with drugs that they don't have to pay for or the government doesn't have to pay for. In fact, um, uh, drug companies that run these clinical trials will actually pay for the drugs in the clinical trials. And um, not all trials are run by drug companies. Uh, uh, some are uh, run by cooperative groups and they provide uh, the drugs as well. But in total, in Calgary alone, in the last year alone, $33 million was saved uh, in drug costs uh, because of clinical trials. So it's really interesting for patients entering clinical trials. Uh, we saved the province $33 million uh, in, uh, while at the same time discovering new things and discovering new treatments for our patients. So let me give you an example of how these clinical trials work and how they improve uh, patient lives. So I, you know, I do a lot of kidney cancer work and I have a lot of dear patients with kidney cancer. And so um, about eight years ago, we did a phase one clinical trial of ipilimumab and nivolumab for metastatic kidney cancer. These two drugs are immunotherapies. They rev up your immune system so that your own immune system attacks the tumors. Um, and they've been found to be really effective. So we did a phase one clinical trial here at the Tom Baker Cancer Center and then participated in a phase three clinical trial with international participation, uh, accruing hundreds of patients with kidney cancer to this. And we found that ipilimumab and nivolumab actually worked and actually worked better than what we currently have. So now it's approved, it's reimbursed, First, anyone with metastatic kidney cancer can now access this as their first line of treatment. And so, um, uh, so it's a success story for clinical trials and for our patients because now we offer a better therapy. But now we want to look at real world databases. How now that it's approved, now that we're using it in real live patients, um, not in the context of clinical trials, how do they do? Do they live longer? Do they have complete remissions, meaning all of the cancer is shrunken away and it's gone? Do they live better? And uh, an example that I want to show you is the International MRCC Database Consortium. So this is the IMDC, the International MRCC Database Consortium. And uh, I'm lucky enough to chair it. Um, and we created it about 12 years ago. And it started with just 69 patients with metastatic kidney cancer. And in kidney cancer, this cancer isn't super common. It's one of the top 10 cancers, but it's not super common. Um, uh, but it really takes a whole bunch of centers to collect all of these patients in order to have enough power to detect differences and to show meaningful results. And so we needed a lot more patients than what just one city could provide. So we created an international uh, consortium. And with international consortiums, you get to take cool photographs like this. So this was at a major meeting. 
training. And this was a lot of our contributors and a lot of Calgarians are here. A lot of uh, uh, trainees are here and people from around the world are here in this photo. The IMDC has created a risk calculator so patients can calculate, patients and physicians can calculate prognosis uh, if they had kidney cancer. Um, and you can find it on imdconline.com. And we've been able to look at, you know, a lot of, um, you know, what, what drives prognosis, what makes someone live longer? How do we replicate that in a future patient so that they live longer too? And so that is really the crux of our work and why we want to do this uh, for our patients. So this calculator, it's six factors, has been translated in Chinese. So this is a WeChat app. It's also available in German, French, English, and really uh, physicians use this around the world to determine what type of kidney cancer therapy they should be choosing, immunotherapy, targeted therapy, or targeted therapy combinations. And so uh, this is an example of how collecting data um, in real world patients can change how we treat them around the world. And it's really neat. And I feel really honored that we can house this database here in Calgary. But you know, it's not just renal cell carcinoma that we excel at here in Calgary. We have huge experts in multiple myeloma, brain tumors, triple negative breast cancer, um, uh, prostate cancer specialists, HCC specialists, and we have huge resources like an immunotherapy database, um, O2, which uh, Dr. Chung will be talking about really soon, uh, the POET program looking at precision oncology, the glands look database looking at lung cancer, patients with lung cancer. And so really there's a whole host of, of expertise at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. And I'm so proud uh, to be there, to work there, and to be surrounded by all these smart people in the basic sciences, in the lab, um, in the clinical trial world, uh, in the psychosocial oncology world, um, and uh, in the epidemiology world. And so uh, it's great to be surrounded by these bright minds. International Clinical Trials Day um, is May 20th of every year. And we took this photo with one of my patients uh, and uh, she's giving me permission um, uh, to use uh, her photo. Uh, and uh, basically she started on a clinical trial and um, she's had a, a tremendous response to this clinical trial. And she's been on this clinical trial for over a year. Uh, and so we're really, we're really happy that these clinical trials exist for our patients uh, to give them hope and to give them treatment. If you know someone with cancer and are looking for clinical trials, um, there's this website here, right here in Alberta, albertacancerclinicaltrials.ca. You can visit this website um, and then you can click on trials in Alberta and uh, you can search for what type of cancer you're looking for, uh, which city, and it'll tell you that in Calgary, there's a breast cancer clinical trial um, looking at this drug for these types of patients. Um, and there's a whole slew of these clinical trials. So you'll find that looking through this database, it's pretty up to date and uh, there are lots of clinical trials available for our patients. So why do we do this? Why do we want to spend so much time, effort, money in doing this? It's for our patients. This is one of my patients too, uh, Roger, and uh, he was on TV. Uh, so this is his TV clip. And he said, looking at a clinical trial, because he participated in a clinical trial as well, it provided more hope than chemotherapy. I knew I was going to receive the best care possible. And he's a dear, dear patient. Um, and so uh, it's exciting to do this for our patients because we want progress. We want discovery for our patients, and we can do that right here. So that's all I've got about clinical trials, and I encourage people to think about trials. If, if you know a cancer patient, ask them to think about clinical trials or ask about clinical trials, uh, because it may be a way of trying cutting edge technology. And if not, at least it brings more information and uh, more knowledge to the patient that comes right after them. So thank you very much again for logging in tonight, and we'll take questions after. And now uh, I'll let Dr. Chung take it away. Thank you. Great. So um, thank you for inviting me uh, first to speak at this event. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, and what I'll do is uh, the next 10 minutes or so really shift gears a little bit and perhaps uh, build upon um, what uh, Dr. Hang and Dr. Chan had um, spoken about, um, about real world data. 
uh, and really talk about uh, research that occurs outside the context of clinical trials. Uh, and to that point, I will describe Alberta's own uh, oncology outcomes or O2 program. Um, just to make sure we're aligned, and again, you've heard from Dr. Chen, Dr. Heng about what um, data are, uh, but I want to perhaps uh, further define what RWE or real world evidence is. Again, in that context, uh, described to you uh, the oncology outcomes or O2 program that is in um, uh, Calgary, Alberta, and also underscore to you the strengths and unique features of our data holdings and why we think uh, we are well positioned to lead in this space. So real world evidence or RWE really is a very broad term and encompasses any scientific information based on analyses that uh, come from data sources outside of clinical trials. You've heard a lot from Dr. Heng already regarding the role and the importance of clinical trials. And I certainly agree with him that it, it is a very uh, pivotal part of research. Uh, having said that, there are a couple of limitations that I'll perhaps highlight to you. And one of which is that trials usually happen in a very controlled setting. Um, usually only very fit young individuals are eligible to participate. So because of that, there are emerging data to suggest that trial findings usually only represent about 10% of the general population. As was already mentioned, uh, it is very useful, however, to use trials to answer the question, can a new drug or a new regimen or a new intervention potentially work? Because it only reflects 10% of the population, uh, there is again increasing awareness there's a data gap or an evidence gap. And this is really where RWE is able to complement clinical trials because it taps into data that is meant to represent the other 90% of the population. And I would propose to you that RWE is perhaps better at addressing, you know, does a drug uh, actually work? Uh, once a drug is proven to be potentially effective, uh, is it truly effective once it's implemented in routine practice? And I think this is especially relevant with an aging general population. Um, you know, we're, uh, the general population is aging and the vast majority of older patients are actually not um, uh, able to participate in trials because of the stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria. And that really was the impetus of forming a group called Oncology Outcomes in Alberta. Um, you know, our motto is, you know, breadth of data, real world inspiration. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, delve into a bit uh, uh, in terms of why we've uh, came up with those mottos. So the vision of this group is really to position um, Alberta as a whole, and in particular Calgary, as a leader in oncology through real world evidence generation that not only incorporates rich data sources, but also complex high level advanced analytics. There are other groups across the country that are also delving into this space. Um, but again, I would want to highlight to you what really sets us apart from um, uh, other groups or other teams. Uh, I think Alberta is unique in the sense that it is a, a moderately sized province. So because of that, it can really uh, benefit from the, um, the, the pros of uh, a sizable province, but also not suffer from the limitations of a smaller province. Um, to that point, we have an integrated provincial healthcare system that encompasses a large population of over 4.5 million residents. In the cancer arena, we also have a provincial electronic medical record system, which is uh, about to be further updated uh, to, to, to roll into a newer system. And so because of that, we have good data. Now, good data is only useful or, or only helpful if they're leveraged appropriately. So to that point, uh, the, in, the inspiration aspect is really um, uh, uh, our current work in terms of collaborating with a strong team of scientists. So this includes biostatisticians, uh, epidemiologists, uh, computer scientists, uh, experts in artificial intelligence, uh, programmers who are conducting work in machine learning. And we're also now working with vendors and companies that specialize in natural language processing. Um, so this type of software is very important because a lot of data is what we call free text. So paragraphs of words dictated by a physician or a nurse. And right now, short of hiring a, a student or a research associate to comb through the chart, it's very hard to get at this data. So with the software, we're hoping to really uh, increase our efficiency in terms of um, getting the data to a point where it's user-friendly and usable. 
Uh, we've also you know, pride ourselves in terms of streamlining our data access process. Um, so now for a simple data request or research query, we can usually turn around that in about three to four months. Uh, when I looked at uh, some of my colleagues who work in different centers, uh, turnaround time in other jurisdictions can be as high as 12 to 18 months. So I think um, this is a very important distinguishing feature of, uh, of our program in Alberta. So in our group, we do work with what we call big data. And, and the name big data, I think, um, is, is a broad label that encompasses many different potential data elements. And again, this slide is not meant to be exhaustive by any means, but I thought it would be helpful to highlight to the group what data is considered big data and uh, what are we currently using to um, uh, answer our research questions. Um, so data really encompasses many different domains. Uh, it would include patient characteristics. So items such as age, sex, uh, in some cases also um, items such as, such as marital status or race. Uh, medication is a big item. Uh, so not only do we know what drugs uh, a patient is prescribed, we may also know dosing as well as start and end date. Uh, medical data is, uh, is a large bucket of data. Uh, so this includes information on uh, other comorbid conditions, um, laboratory data, and even uh, visits to the, the ER as well as the hospital. Of course, uh, not all patients uh, are able to um, be cured of their cancer or disease. So some do succumb to their condition and we have information on their death as well. On the right side, I would say are newer data elements that we're continually working to enhance our data repository. So this includes a family history. So do other family members of the patient have heart disease or cancer? Uh, lifestyle factors is also of interest. So this consists of smoking history, uh, information about alcohol use. Patient reported outcomes is an emerging area. And this is really asking patients themselves um, what their symptoms are like, uh, what's their quality of life. Uh, th these surveys are also fed into our big pool of data to further en enhance the breadth and scope of the information that we have on hand that can be used to answer questions. And then finally, uh, the category that um, we are uh, also tapping into are the social environmental aspects. So income level, education level, these are factors that are known to correlate with survival outcomes and cancer outcomes. So um, they're definitely of high interest as well. Uh, what I'm not showing here are also other things we're um, currently working on to, to add to our um, data pool. So this includes biomarker and genomic data um, taken from uh, patient tumor samples. So with all this data, what can we actually address? And uh, I would you know, highlight that there's a number of um, questions that can be uh, uh, considered uh, and really runs the full gamut, a very wide spectrum. So we can look at diagnosis. What's the timing of cancer diagnosis? Is it early, is it late? We can ascertain information on quality of their care. How adherent uh, is a, patient, uh, a patient's treatment according to guidelines? What is the cost of this care? Uh, what treatments are they actually getting? And in turn, how do, the, how do these treatments impact their survival and quality of life? And again, for those who uh, are not cured of their cancer, uh, there are increasing uh, number of data elements that can look at symptoms and also their end of life care. I, I'm gonna uh, end uh, with uh, a concrete example of how we are leveraging data. So I've chosen pancreatic cancer because I treat this uh, condition. But also it's been in the news lately because of you know, well-known TV celebrities who have also succumbed to this disease. Um, uh, it is a highly fatal cancer. And, and uh, what's interesting is that there are a number of potential reasons why uh, there is a high fat fatality. So there could be late detection or diagnosis, poor access to the cancer center, or perhaps treatment is not, uh, not optimal. Uh, what's fascinating is that because of the clinical trials that Dr. Heng described, there have been significant advances in chemotherapy options for this disease. Uh, in the span of about 10 years, survival has essentially tripled from about six months to, to about 18 months. What's also interesting, however, is that when studies have been conducted comparing clinical trial outcomes and outcomes in the real world, usually it is not uh, exactly the same. 
So earlier I mentioned that outcomes in pancreatic cancer is about 18 months. So using real world data, we can look at, well, is it also 18 months uh, in the real world? And the short answer is that some groups have survival that stimulate your clinical trials, but there's a fair number of groups that do not have 18 months of survival. So really the, the question now is what are the reasons driving this, um, this, this difference? Again, using the same data sources that I just described, uh, we asked a few follow-up questions uh, in terms of, well, of those who get pancreatic cancer, how many are referred to an oncologist? Uh, likewise, among those who are referred, how many are treated? And we do find that not everyone is treated. So seven out of 10 people are referred to see an oncologist, and then about five uh, actually get treatment. And again, this is uh, very similar. Uh, when, when I talk to uh, colleagues who are doing similar work in other provinces, other countries, they're finding very similar findings. So this is not unique to Alberta. So to really address this referral, this potential referral and also treatment gap, um, you know, we followed this up. We're, we're developing a potential app that can be rolled out to hopefully address some of these uh, potential gaps in care. Uh, so this is the pancreatic cancer app. This is a beta version, so it's not rolled out just yet. But this app um, um, uh, really um, focuses on, on uh, information that might be useful for a patient. So it includes information on what are the early symptoms of pancreatic cancer and what might flag a patient to perhaps consider seeking medical attention. We've done a similar uh, app, but a physician version to really boost referral, meaning that for a family physician who's seeing a patient with pancreatic cancer, um, uh, we've outlined all the resources available to them to hopefully optimize the, the referral rate. So that was really a whirlwind snapshot of what uh, we do in the O2 team. Um, there's a lot more that I can uh, you know, speak to. Um, but with a time limitation, I'll, 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 I'll probably uh, end here. Um, but what I'll uh, mention uh, specifically is a new center. Uh, Dr. Morris will speak more to this in a few minutes, uh, but I do want to in, you know, underscore to all of you that at this new center on the top floor, uh, there will be about 30 workspaces dedicated to real world evidence generation. Uh, again, this is quite unique to Calgary, Alberta, uh, to have a, you know, a, a contiguous physical space where all the data scientists can work together uh, collaborate. I think it really uh, uh, puts us in a good position to to excel in this uh, in this research field. So with that, I will uh, end. And again, as Dr. Heng mentioned, uh, we'll address questions at the end. Uh, and now I'll hand over the virtual podium to uh, Dr. Morris. So thanks, Winston. Um, I was asked just to give a, a brief update on this large building that's being erected at the corner of the TransCanada 16th Avenue and, and 29th Street. And so by way of introduction, uh, I too am a medical oncologist by training, a clinician scientist, and have recently taken over as the department head of both the clinical and academic departments of oncology. And, and the medical uh, facility director for the Tom Baker and also the new cancer center medical lead. And so um, it's really with great pleasure that I sort of give an update on this large structure that's going up. And, and, I, and I preface any of these talks with the fact that, you know, the new cancer center is a brick and mortar uh, building. It's really about what goes in it. What are the people, what are the patients I go through it that really is going to make this a success. I reminisced back when I started um, as, a, as a junior medical oncologist many, many years ago. And uh, at the Tom Baker, when we moved into the existing structure that we work out of now in the late 1990s, you know, we were out of space in 2003 and we've been sort of now expanded to the Richmond Road, the old Children's Hospital, and then another move to the Holy Cross downtown. And so we are a two-site operation, and certainly space has been at a premium for, for over a decade. And so this is really um, comfort to me to uh, say that, you know, this is a picture that Winston just showed, but this is the artist depiction of what this new cancer center is going to look like much larger footprint and, and going to the research uh, because this has significant research activities 
even in that preclinical setting and in the clinical trial setting that we heard about. Um, but the entire square footage of the current Tom Baker is about the same size as the research space in this new building. Um, so that just gives you pause for thought in terms of at least the physical footprint that we will be able to use uh, for really um, sort of research intensive and, uh, and driving that forward into uh, the best patient care uh, in Canada and hopefully internationally. So I, I have a couple of slides here just with regard to some of you know, the timelines of where we were and, and where we need to get to. And so I won't go back to the history of 2003, 2004, when we started planning for a new cancer center and with some you know, sort of election cycles and stops and starts, and then stops again. Uh, really, this project took form in sort of a functional planning step back as early as 2012. And then the project was actually announced in 2015. And this was a design build um, so that we could do it quickly with minimal changes. And really, groundbreaking was in 2017, uh, late 2017. And you can see the size of the building, and I'll show some pictures towards the end that were um, on schedule, on budget, and in fact, we're watertight now, and the cranes that are a testament to where things are at are coming down now because everything's being concentrated on the inside. So we're here in, you can't really read it very well, but in the construction and building commissioning. So we're getting ready for operations. And this gives us sort of a, another timeline where we're starting now. So we're going through the organizational planning, the operational readiness, the commissioning. So there's lots of equipment and lots of areas that need to be commissioned, approved before uh, patients and staff would be uh, have them accessible. And then we're estimating open to service in the spring of 2023. And then obviously there's some post-occupancy support structures that need to be in place. But spring 2023 would be our, our goal. And as I said, we're, we're on time as it stands now. So I put this slide in really just to sort of say we're in this transition phase of the build is pretty much completed. I mean, there's lots to be done in the interior, but, but the build is, is as you see it. The uh, external facade is being uh, finished. The parkades, uh, it's another 1,450 parking stalls with five floors below ground are pretty much completed now. And now we're into this operational readiness, which means that we need to get people together, including a very large, very active uh, patient and family um, care group that are really helping us with all of our uh, decisions so that we in fact involve patients, family, caregivers in this build as part of theirs. And I, and I think that is really a testament to the vision of this cancer center and what we want it to be. So the living half, the operational readiness part is trying to get all of the various people that will um, uh, be housed in this building, including research, including our clinical staff, including all of our support staff. And how do we use this opportunity to really make a very efficient, um, patient-friendly, patient-centered, um, but dynamic, innovative, cutting-edge uh, care facility? A few quick facts. I won't go through all of them, but this is a large building. This is 1.3 million square feet. And that's not including the underground parking. Um, you can read this as well as I can state it, but there's lots of activity in this building. And, and one of the interesting ones, uh, this was used to be, you know, the site used to be lot seven, which was a staff uh, surface parking lot. And when we all got displaced from that lot to lot eight, which is a parkade, we could look down on top of the the hole that was being excavated and somebody did this calculation that the amount of dirt that was removed was equivalent to 5.2 million wheelbarrows or 450,000 cubic meters of dirt. So a lot of, of excavation, if you will. The building is now 13 floors and that's topped out. Um, and uh, as I said, the patient, the patient and family advisors have volunteered over 4,800 hours since the project and they were involved right from the inception in 2014. 
So I'll just go through a little bit of a few pictures because I think a picture is worth a thousand words in this case. And, and so this was the former lot seven where we used to park. Uh, the asphalt was pulled up in 2017. And jumping ahead to this year, this is April of 2020. And this is a view looking to the Southeast. And so this would be across the Trans Canada and what used to be sort of the stadium uh, mall that's now being demolished for, for condominiums. But you can see sort of the magnitude of this building and then different elevations. You can look, this is from uh, the 10th floor view the panel on the right, uh, looking towards um, uh, I, I, across the stadium mall and towards the university. And this is a view from the uh, southeast looking northwest. And it gives you a sense of uh, sort of this, um, it's supposed to represent arms sort of embracing the heart, which is this open area, which is really effectively allowed for light to be, uh, natural light to be in, in most of the building in terms of uh, uh, best for, for patient, inpatient care, best for staff health, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, this is the inside uh, uh, part. Um, and all of the glass here will be dynamic glass. It'll adjust to light, ambient light on the outside. Uh, the building itself will have actually these autonomous uh, vehicles that will move things around from uh, area to area, whether it be linens, whether it be other uh, uh, equipment, uh, much like you would see in a sort of a Star Wars movie, if you will. This picture is the front entrance. So it'll be a fairly grand front entrance. Um, and there will be uh, lots of opportunities to depict some of our cutting edge research, uh, information kiosks and on how you get involved. There'll be obviously abilities to uh, donate where appropriate, whether that's time or financially. Uh, but it really is uh, a measure of coming together of both the University of Calgary, Cummings School of Medicine, Charbonneau Cancer Institute, as well as with uh, the more clinically associated side, Alberta Health Services, Cancer Care Alberta, uh, and then the Department of Oncology and, and what we know as the Tom Baker currently. So it really will be an ability to move uh, people together. And I think that's where we get the best care so that researchers talk to clinicians and vice versa, that ideas can be percolated through people that could actually um, uh, embrace those things and champion them. And areas of research that are coming up more from the preclinical models, whether it be test tubes or mice, um, can actually be then put into the clinical trials design uh, system that uh, you heard about earlier this evening. Just some more pictures cranes are coming down. And, and just a testament, I, I always like showing this slide because as a testament, the, the um, lower part of the southeast wing of the, of the uh, build actually will have a living garden on the top of it that will be open for patients and, and staff alike. And in fact, the plants that will go onto this area are currently being grown just outside of uh, Calgary currently. So that's the type of planning that's already going into, into the system. The other thing, I'll just show you a schematic. This is a bird's eye view of the um, um, level six. And, and I just wanted to sort of, there's no test at the end of this because you probably can't see it, but the, the area in purple is our clinical research unit. So that's clinical trials. We have our research pharmacy right adjacent to it. And then we have our tre outpatient treatment areas where a lot of the clinical trials take place in the darker orange. And so everything is, is co-located um, for one efficiencies, but also to give the sense to a patient coming in that you know this is really important uh, part of our, our our work, and and this is how we're going to be cutting edge and, and known on the map. Uh, the other thing to do is there still be a cancer footprint within the Foothills campus, and we need a connection from this building across into the research in the Foothills uh, Hospital proper because there will be shared services uh, between the two centers, if you will. And so this is the initiation of, of what I would describe as sort of a plus 15 level, it'll be two levels, um, but the magnitude of this is actually quite, uh, quite large because patients will have to be um, transported in the, pub or in the um, 
the uh, on one of the levels, and this is over the current on the left panel, the current emergency uh, department. Um, and so some of the data now as of September, so last month, cranes are being removed. We have about 1,250 workers on site. We've had now six COVID positive workers, none of which got it from the uh, from tracking from the uh, association with each other within the build. Uh, it's all done externally through the community. So I think that's a testament for the amount of uh, uh, worker protection that we've put on. We've had only three recordable injuries to date, uh, which is exceptional with that number of workers on site. Um, lots of uh, concrete being uh, installed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then just to sort of give you a, a written timeline. So all of this stuff will be done and by 2022 will be fairly complete for that 2023 occupancy. And so this was actually a shot that was taken by um, the drone that, um, that the construction PCL has. And this was actually taken as of yesterday. So it's an up-to-date sort of picture of where we're at now and actually rem uh, resembles that first uh, artist's depiction of the center quite well, I think. So these are our partners, Alberta government, you know, this is an Alberta health build um, that is contracted uh, by um, Alberta infrastructure who actually does the build and then Alberta health services uh, for the operational side. We have great linkages with the University of Calgary with the Alberta Cancer Foundation and then our builders and designers, and more importantly, our patients, our families are the real key partners in, in the center of this project. So I know we're gonna take uh, questions in a batch at the end, but hopefully that gives you at least a current update of, of this wonderful facility um, that uh, will service obviously Calgary, Southern Alberta, Alberta, and probably beyond. So very excited about this. And, and this will be a real opportunity to put Calgary on the map. So thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks everybody for your presentations. Um, so that portion concludes um, the talks. Uh, and now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna really open it up to, to people for questions. I do have a list of questions that were submitted that were submitted in advance, so we'll go through those as well. And I'll keep um, I'll keep an eye on the chat box. Uh, when you have questions, I'll, I'll just point out if you're not familiar with Zoom, at the bottom of the sort of Zoom screen, you see a, a thing that looks like a little I don't know speaking bubble. That's uh, how you would initiate um, putting something into the chat. Uh, so please use that if you want to either make a comment or um, you know uh, pose a question. Uh, I, I appreciate some comments in there. Actually, it's really nice to hear that um, there are people who uh, reported great care and um, joining clinical trials. Uh, so um, uh, thanks very much. Um, and great talks uh, for all of you. Uh, Don, Danny, and Winston, great talks. Um, okay, so I, um, I'm i gonna start out, uh, I'll kind of direct it to, to all of you and maybe you guys can pick up. <laughs> Um, so one question that um, came up is, uh, how can patients make responsible decisions around participating in clinical trials versus um, continuing with standard of care? Um, you know, what, how, how, do you, how do you navigate that as a patient? That's a really good question, uh, Jennifer, and thanks uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for the audience uh, for that question. And so um, clinical trials are voluntary. Uh, clinical trials, uh, you discuss them with your oncologist and you make the decision together. With each clinical trial, there's a 30 page consent form and it tells you about all the pros and cons. Often, often the cons are your time. You need to spend a lot more time, uh, more patient visits, uh, more CT scans, uh, more monitoring with our clinical trials nurses. Um, and so, so the biggest con is probably your time. And in terms of pros, um, uh, the pro is potentially trying something that's cutting edge, something that's the newest medicine, the newest experimental therapy, the newest research. Um, uh, and a chance to help uh, patients in the future. 
So it is a personal decision whether or not to uh, uh, participate in a clinical trial. And we always, it's definitely voluntary, uh, but we make sure we educate our patients about it to know that it is an available option, make it available to them, and then, uh, and then you can decide from there. Um, and just sort of following up on that question, um, so how much should patients expect to do sort of on their own um, to find out about the trials versus um, sort of being presented those um, opportunities from their oncologist? That's a great question. There, all trials are different. There are some really simple trials, like trials of uh, just doing some extra blood work or a new CT scan. Uh, that that requires um, uh, uh, less. Uh, less debating, I guess, uh, 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 internal debate. And then there's some really complicated trials such as, oh, this is the first time, uh, you know, a human has used this medication. And so there's a lot more risk involved with it. And then somewhere in the middle where it's something that's been studied in a phase one trial, studied in a phase two trial, it's already approved in a different type of cancer. So it's not like you're the first person in the world using it. Um, uh, and is that something that you want to try? In terms of who else you could talk to about clinical trials, trials other than your oncologist. Oftentimes uh, there are um, patient support groups. So for kidney cancer, there's Kidney Cancer Canada. Uh, there's also Bladder Cancer Canada. Um, uh, and there's similar patient organizations that might have some information about that. But I think the biggest source of information comes from your oncologist uh, and seeing what the pros and cons are and then discussing it with yourself, amongst yourselves, your family members, your friends to see whether or not a clinical trial is for you. Um, with all of that um, follow-up, uh, you said like a lots of testing and you know extra scans and things like that. Um, do do patients in clinical trials do? I've heard this. Do they do better just because you're you're on a trial? Like. Can you tell me about that? Oh, that's interesting. So I think there are a few reasons why patients can do better on a clinical trial. So A, they could do better on the clinical trial if they're on the, ex uh, on an, uh, the experimental arm and the experimental arm turns out to be better. And so that's one potential possibility. That's not always guaranteed. It doesn't always happen that way. The second reason why uh, patients on clinical trials do better is because they tend to be healthier people. So if you can imagine if uh, I presented a clinical trial to someone and said you have more uh, CT scans, you have to come to the office uh, uh, for a few more visits, you kind of have to be healthy enough to walk there, to, uh, to drive to the cancer center, and you have to live close enough to the cancer center. So Dr. Chung was talking about inclusion and exclusion criteria. and. Um, uh, and uh, those are fairly strict and it narrows the patient population quite a bit so that we actually select patients that are healthier. And uh, then finally, uh, the third uh, potential reason why patients might do well on the clinical trials is that extra monitoring. There are often extra visits. So you actually see a clinical trials nurse all the time. Uh, you have another point of contact into the cancer center. Um, and so you just get monitored more frequently. And if you have a problem, you can talk to them um, uh, and access someone quite quickly. And so those are the potential advantages to clinical trials and why patients may seem to live uh, longer or do better on clinical trials. That's a great question, Dr. Chan. That's interesting. So I wanted to pick up on um, your, your contrast with um, real world. Um, and so uh, maybe this is more for you, Vincent. Um, so we think of, you know, clinical trials as something that, you know, is going to change something that you're doing like today. What about real world evidence? Because it seems like, you know, you've got this big data. Um, can this big data and, and this real world evidence um, be used to make decisions about kind of your care or patient's care sort of in, in real time? Or is it more of a, a retro thing? Can you explain how it'd be used on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, um, I would say by and large right now, it is um, what you were referring to retrospective, meaning that uh, we, we spend time and resources to collect data and maybe six to 12 months later, we might look backwards and see, okay, how did the patient as a population how did they fare? Did they do really well? Did they not do well? Uh, what are the factors that made them do better or, 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 or worse? Um, more and more now, many jurisdictions, including Calgary, we're, we're talking about the possibility of really generating real-time data. Um, so many people have termed this like a, li like a living health systems where uh, data are generated you know, live for each patient. And uh, before each visit, for example, 
uh, the patient-specific data can be looked at, reviewed, and have that be used to inform their care. Um, so I do think a new uh, cancer center would be a really good platform and opportunity to really um, you know, leverage the, 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 the momentum there and to create that kind of system. Uh, it is a work in progress, so it will take you know, a lot of resources, but I do think um, it's uh, aligned with our vision in terms of how data can be used, um, you know, used better and, and more broadly. Can, can it also be used um, not uh, only to sort of in, influence um, sort of decision making around the treatment, but can you use that same data to find out new stuff about who gets cancer or risk factors for cancer um, and you know, how they're associated with different kinds of cancer? Um, what other stuff is possible with that in real, because it sounds, it sounds like a ton of data, right? Right. Yeah, so there is a, um, a, a branch of uh, real world evidence called predictive or position analytics. Um, so how can we leverage the data to predict outcomes, uh, to predict who, you know, who does better, uh, to predict who responds better to chemotherapy? Um, so again, uh, it is, uh, again, a work in progress, no early days yet, uh, but there are team members, you know, as part of O2, where this is a major interest of theirs, uh, to see how we can make sense of the data. Because sometimes it is quite overwhelming. There's a lot to kind of comb through. Um, so how do we make it user-friendly and usable? Um, just because if it's too complicated, I think it's very difficult for a busy clinician or a busy patient to uh, understand fully. Uh, so part of the analytics piece is to make it, again, you know, usable uh, for, for frontline people. Um, so that includes patients, families, and also healthcare providers. Yeah, you know, it seems like more and more, um, so for everybody else, because I didn't, I didn't give a talk, you know, I'm more on the lab side, but, you know, more and more is... Uh, going towards genomics and precision medicine. And even at that scale, the amount of information that needs to be processed in order to make these decisions, it's just sort of exploding. Um, so anyway, that, uh, you know, that amount of data, you know, anything that you make for that will be useful for, for the analysis of all sorts of data coming in mm -hmm. um, about uh, cancer and prediction. Um, I had a question, uh, there was a question about the, the cancer center um, and clinical trials. So you, Don, I, I guess this is for you. Um, that's a huge footprint, like you said. What does it mean for like the throughput of how many patients could be on trials? And, and does it change like what kind of trials could be performed um, that, you know, we maybe we don't have capacity now? Yeah, great question, Jen. Um, so I think the latter part of your question was really about what are the opportunities this new cancer center and everything that goes with it uh, allow for clinical trial expansion? And so one of the areas that Danny had talked about was early clinical trials, first in man trials, phase one trials, if you will. And so, you know, how does a new cancer center actually facilitate that? Well, it allows us to attract talent. It allows us to retain talent. But it also allows a lot of things that are working well in the lab or in the animal or in the test tube to be brought forward. So I think it allows us opportunities for what we describe as sort of um, investigator initiated trials. So instead of having various therapeutic options coming from say big pharma or from other biotech outside, it allows us to actually be creative with regard to homegrown talent and, and some of the um, some of the things that we can actually bring forward that are currently ongoing within the research domain are already coming to clinical trials. And this new building will allow efficiencies. It'll allow space, which is a big issue currently con con uh, with constraints for clinical trial activity. But again, it allows us, going back to some of Winston's comments, it allows us to track, even though they're on trials, it allows us to track their progress, their outcome, what second line or third line treatments they may receive. It allows us then to use uh, patients after informed consent to say, can we follow your, your, your case, if you will? Can we use a tube of blood in other ways? Can we use tumor sample that's already been collected or a new biopsy to actually not only help your case in terms of next decision, in terms of what your therapeutic options are, but also allow us to learn as we go. And so I look at clinical trials as really being more of a village uh, that includes researchers, includes clinicians, includes trialists, but more importantly, includes patients and their families. And, and I just think we need to develop that culture that everyone's on board with that as long as it's appropriate for that individual. And, and so then we bring in sort of that real-time learning. 
and, and I think that's what it is. We don't have to wait for for two years before we come up with sort of a decision about whether that worked or not, or we should have nuanced this or that. So that's where I think it's going to be helpful. So with um with such an increase, I guess an increase in the potential number of um I guess the number of patients going through on clinical trials just because we have more space and you know you know more capacity, more chairs. Um, it will it be sufficient to have our current workforce? I, I see this question actually. This is a great question. Is there a budget portion for recruiting new clinicians and scientists for the new cancer center? And I, I mean, like first of all, you know, the, the more the better in in my mind. But um, really, I uh, I suppose is this is this a need? Are we going to hit a point where um, there hopefully we do where there are more patients than we ever expected to be on clinical trials? So what's the is there a plan for growth? Um, for supporting all of this activity? You might not have the answer, <laughs> I don't know. Well, I have the answer. I'm not sure I have the money, but I have the answer. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the bottom line here is that we have existing talent and, you know, it's always amazes me whenever we do sort of even year end sort of um, reports, just how much talent we currently have in Calgary. And, and I don't think we market ourselves very well. We don't get the word out but we are really lucky to have great people. As for augmenting it, and absolutely we have to, we have to get talent, we have to get all sort of uh, stages of academic and clinical uh, abilities in terms of junior staff, mid-career, uh, senior scientists and senior clinicians. How do we do that? Well, I'll tell you the cancer center itself, the new cancer center is a bit of a magnet. People wanna work in a new building and such. But we need to be very thoughtful, and some of it will be with our philanthropic help um, to create uh, new research chairs, clinical chairs, uh, highly skilled individuals to come on board. And it's not just the people at the top, it's the people that are actually doing some of the work in the labs, it's people that are doing clinical work, our healthcare teams, uh, and again, it's that village concept. And so how do we pay for all of that? Well, we need to be creative. I mean, there's no doubt that the current in, uh, in environment, we're in the middle of COVID. Um, what are the issues with regard to sort of uh, GDP and, and all of those kinds of words? Uh, it's tough, but this is the time for us to be innovative, be creative and really sell a vision that perhaps, you know, uh, surmounts the fiscal realities that we have to deal with, right? And, and so that's the way I can answer the question. Yeah, yeah, no. And you know, it's it's true. It's going to take a lot of different partnership, I think, to um, to have all the activities like to have it reach its potential, right? I mean, there's there's all the research that goes on that needs to be funded. There are the trainees who are benefiting from all of that, um, and yeah, there are the the clinicians and scientists and clinician scientists who are needed to really cover that spectrum of work. So, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to all work together and try to find. Um, I think sources that will, again, be supportive of the mission because it's such a great opportunity. Anyway, who, who are, Ori, uh, thank you for that question. Can I just um, make one other, one other comment just along those lines? I mean, as much as physicians, healthcare workers, researchers aren't really trained into revenue generation, if you will, there's opportunities here with regard to commercialization of things. There's opportunities for training of high quality you know, high, highly qualified personnel. There's stuff that's outside of cancer. There's stuff outside of the healthcare system that actually can have benefit from some of the learnings that come out of this. And so I do think this is a diversification activity of the economy, if you will, if we do it right. So I think there's a lot of sort of other sort of tangible benefits to this that could be revenue generating to support hiring good people. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I had a couple more questions that were submitted about clinical trials. Um, so uh, one of them was, um, how do you, yeah, how do you find out which trials you qualify for, um, and how do you find out more about uh, a trial? Um, uh, you know, you alluded to your asking your oncologist, um, but yeah, how do they determine who's eligible or not? Yeah, 
Um, so with every clinical trial, there are strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. And oftentimes there are 30 criteria that you have to fulfill. And so it can, it can be um, a bit daunting to sort through them all, but that's what our, our team is for. That's what we do. To find out more about clinical trials, you can go onto that website that I showed you, uh, albertaclinicaltrials.ca, and uh, it gives you um, a, a rundown of what the clinical trial is. If you want more information about it, you can search that exact same clinical trial in a database called clinicaltrials.gov. So if you Google clinicaltrials.gov um, and you put in that clinical trial, then it'll give you actually all the inclusion and exclusion criteria. It'll tell you uh, which arm, uh, what does arm A get? What does arm B get? Uh, what are you randomized to? And it gives you a lot more of that information. It is a huge sea of stuff out there because there are clinical trials everywhere around the world, if you can imagine. There are lots of different clinical trials. Um, and so, so your, your oncologist helps you navigate that ocean of clinical trials. Um, so, uh, uh, so I... I would ask my oncologist to say, you know, uh, are there clinical trials for me? What fits me? What do you think would work well in me or not? And do you think this is a good fit for me or not? And so those are some questions to ask your oncologist. Um, I see that we're at 7.15, um, which is when we're supposed to end. I'm gonna ask maybe one, I'm gonna ask one more question. It's kind of for everybody. Um, uh, and I think there are a few people who are saying, um, what are some of the most promising, I guess, types of treatments that are in trials right now? And I understand it might be disease specific, but um, I think some people are asking about heme malignancies, um, lung cancers. Um, yeah, if you could just provide like a couple of words, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I could start off by one that covers many different cancer types and that sort of that immune system components that and he had talked about with his kidney cancer patients, you know, stimulating the immune system. And I sort of have to have the disclaimer that I am an immunologist. So this kind of uh, is close to my heart, if you will. But revving up the immune system to kill cancer. And now there's so many different strategies that can now be put into clinical trials. I think that is one of the big opportunities as a game changer. Uh, not just for Calgary, but worldwide for our patients, if you will. But we have an opportunity locally here to really challenge the status quo and, and get into the next next rounds. Anybody else want to chime in with your favorite? I think precision oncology in general with the sort of matching drugs might be another area. targeted there. You know, there's so much out there. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, before 10 years ago, uh, uh, it was it was chemotherapy, the age of chemotherapy. And then uh, within the last 10 years, it was the age of targeted therapy because we had targets, uh, drugs to specific targets in, in genomic, uh, uh, in gen with genomic mutations. And then we started to try to uh, like identify specific mutations and try to target them uh, using very broad things like foundation medicine. But we found that, you know, it doesn't work all the time. And then as Don said, with immunotherapy, now now we're in the age of immunotherapy. So what's next? There's so many things. There are new targets, new ways of targeting the immune system. There are CAR T cell therapies where we're actually biologically engineering T cells, immune system cells, uh, to try to specific uh, to try to attack specific cancers. Like who would have thought we could bioengineer uh, a receptor or bioengineer a T cell? Uh, and then there are bi-specific T cell engagers. There's so many things. Things. Uh, well, I could talk forever. About, uh, <laughs> no, that's I, that's why clinical trials are so exciting, right? I mean, um, the potential and and each one, you know, they they might not all work, but some of them do, right? And then it opens up a whole area of research. Um, I want to thank you guys so much um, for this. Uh, we're we're sort of at the end here. Um, there was, I just wanted to mention for the audience, um, you know, before the session, there was a survey before the session um, uh, in the chat box, um, there's some information on surveys uh, for after the session, but please also um, as part of that survey, um, we have received a few suggestions in the pre, whatever pre-session survey for future topics, but the survey for afterwards will also include a chance to um, put in a suggestion for um, a future uh, late night lab uh, uh, topic. Um, so I think that's the, the end for, for me uh, and maybe I'll turn it back to 
Calgary Public Library just for a second, if you want to. There you go. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, I just want to say once again, you know, thank you to to the entire team here for presenting and for everyone for coming out this evening. And uh, you know, I just want to really thank Jennifer for doing such a great job and and moderating the session and also to our speakers, you know, Daniel, Winston and Don, Don thank you so much for, for sharing your insights and your experience. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Thank you much, everyone. Thank you. See you guys next thank time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.